Thank you very much. I'd like to uh, thank the chair and the co-chair for the kind invitation and uh, for the uh, honor of being part of this distinguished panel. The topics uh, that I was assigned today is reoperative and revisional bariatric endoscopy, and I have no disclosures. In order to stay on time, I limited my uh, talk to these uh, particular points. Uh, endoscopy used for recidivism after uh, one way gastric bypass and sleep gastrectomy, and the use of endoscopy for complications, both leaks and strictures. Some of these concepts have already been uh, discussed, so we're going to go quickly through this. Uh, there's obviously no universal ac uh, acceptance of what the definition of success or failure of uh, uh, weight loss procedure is. We use the BMI of 50 as a cutoff historically. But we do know that approximately 30% of gastric bypass, for instance, uh, will fail or at least will have some regain of weight over time, and that's known from the uh, SOS study. Obviously, if that's the trend, uh, with the fact that we're doing more bariatric operations, uh, we can uh, not expect other than an increase of the revisional procedures over the years. And according to the latest numbers, the revisions are up to 14%, which equal 29,000 operations in the US. This uh, slide has already been dissected by Dr. Higa, so we're not going to go uh, very uh, in details, but this is really the fundamental reason why people perform endoscopic pouch and uh, anastomosis reduction based on this data, this linear correlation between the size of the anastomosis and weight regain, and using 15 as the cutoff point of a balance uh, between uh, good weight loss uh, but tolerance of uh, oral intake. So we do know that whenever we reoperate uh, uh, gastric procedures, gastric bypass or whatever not, uh, even in, uh, in the ends of very experienced and competent people, the uh, uh, complications are much higher. 13% uh, 13, 13 leaks, uh, mortality of 2%, and conversion of 10%. And that is the reason why endoscopy might play a role in these cases. Uh, Initially, and probably historically now, sclerotherapy was utilized in patients to reduce the size of the anastomosis. This is a study on 231 uh, gastric bypass, 575 sclerotherapy sessions, which means that it's something that you have to repeat. Uh, the goal, of course, was to reduce the size of the anastomosis, and they obtained 18% uh, results, which is certainly not stellar. And when we look at other publications uh, well, with a similar technique, uh, overall there was a, a decent uh, um, result, but the time of follow-up was uh, at most uh, 12 months. So if it's on one end, uh, the sclerotherapy is accessible and technically easy, reproducible and cheap and safe and probably effective short term, on the contrary, it requires multiple sessions. The availability of uh, the substance to do the sclerotherapy is becoming less and less uh, uh, available. Um, and it's probably not effective for very large anastomosis, which defeats the purpose in the first place. And today, we certainly have better options available. So that's probably is a, a type of technique that should not be used any longer. What about using the argobine then to obtain the same goal of reducing the anastomosis? Uh, in this case, we intentionally touch the mucosa with the argon bean, something that we tend not to do normally, but the idea is to uh, obviously uh, procure and uh, induce scarring deep inside. It's cost effective and reproducible. And uh, the small series of patients that we have, it seems to be uh, uh, safe uh, and overall well tolerated. And the goal is to reduce the anastomosis that are approximately 10 millimeter. But just for on the, on the study, for instance, of Chris Thompson, they maintained the patients on 45 days of a liquid diet. Now, each one of us knows how difficult it is to convince patients to stay on a diet two weeks prior to an operation when they're at the highest level of motivation. Imagine patients that have failed uh, a bariatric operation, and now we're asking them to stay for 45 days on a liquid diet. It's probably not going to happen in most practices. Um, other options uh, are suturing devices, and of course there's many different uh, options available in the market. Uh, if you blink, that option is gone because they tend to be pulled and then put back in the market in a different, uh, under a different name and so forth. The reality is that all these uh, studies are done with the same concept uh, that uh, reducing the anastomosis will give good results. 
This is a 25 uh, patient study uh, by Chris Thompson and his group uh, in which they initially ablated the anastomosis with APC and then placed interrupted sutures using the Apollo overstitch. Um, this is the way it would look before and after, and of course the results, at least endoscopically, seems to be very, very good. Um, and uh, even their numbers short term are decent. The question, of course, is the durability of these procedures, number one, and number two, the durability of uh, uh, narrowing the anastomosis, no matter how we do it, uh, we still don't have answers if it's uh, uh, worthwhile uh, over time. Um, they also compared the overstitch to another device in which the approximation is limited to the mucosa, and, and also they included a sham um, arm into this study. And of course, the results were significantly better for the overstitch in which there's a full text and approximation of tissue as opposed to the other two arms. Um, then we get more technical. So maybe instead of doing uh, interrupted sutures, we should do a purse string. And in this uh, elegant study, uh, they demonstrated that actually a purse string has better results in terms of weight loss and final anastomosis diameter. And last but not least uh, uh, of these devices, uh, the USGI uh, uh, device uh, for the ROSE procedure. Um, this is the multi-center uh, trial that evaluating the efficacy of this uh, device, which of course short term was e effective. There were many more complications. Uh, at 12 months there was uh, weight loss, uh, but again the durability of these procedures are still in question. Let's switch gear and talk about leaks. Uh, we do know that leaks, of course, are a lot uh, more prevalent uh, after um, revisional procedures, and when we talk about uh, sleeves and leaks, uh, the percentages go up to uh, two, two and a half percent. Bougie size, distal obstruction, ischemia, hematoma are some of the factors that are involved. Um, and the question is, what can we do endoscopically? Um, the, uh, most of the indications for endoscopic uh, procedures after sleeve uh, leaks uh, are related to stenting, internal drainage, septotomy, a direct closure, and uh, potentially endoluminal vacuum. So we're going to uh, briefly touch to uh, each one of those uh, aspects. It's important to discuss also the timing of endoscopy. Historically, we've been staying away from doing endoscopy early on, but we're learning with time that that's not a dangerous thing. And actually, when it comes to intervene on leaks and strictures, it's probably much better to intervene sooner than later. Um, and in fact, in this uh, small study with 27 patients, although each one of the patients obtained healing uh, of uh, the uh, leak, uh, the healing was much faster in the patient that had an earlier intervention as opposed to patients that had a later intervention. And in this multi-center uh, study of 110 patients, they identified four factors that were directly related to the healing after an endoscopic procedure. And one was uh, the early diagnosis, less than 21 days, the presence of a small fish flow, obviously, uh, the interval between the diagnosis and the intervention endoscopically, and finally, if there was a history of a previous bend or not for the scar tissue that, of course, will impair uh, the closure of the leakage. So, um, in an effort to uh, understand the uh, outcome uh, and, and come up with an algorithm, uh, and Dr. Gagné published this series where it stratified the leaks in, in two uh, different groups, uh, less than one millimeter, more than one millimeter, and uh, uh, 10 millimeters, sorry, and then uh, uh, understanding whether or not there was stenosis related uh, uh, to, the, uh, to, to the leak and, and basically uh, design an algorithm based on the uh, anatomy of the leak itself. Uh, so less than 10 millimeter and no stenosis, uh, probably a pigtail that we will discuss shortly. Um, to drain internally the leak first and then reassess endoscopically. If there's a twist, uh, putting a stent to dilate, obviously, the, uh, uh, the distal obstruction, um, and then reassess. And then if the leak is still large, another stent. If the leak had shrunk in the meantime, uh, go back to the left side of the graph and put pigtail in order to close the leak. So 
uh, speaking of stents, there's two main kinds of stents, and they work in a completely different uh, way. Um, the self-expandable stent have uh, the purpose of using those stents is to isolate the site of leakage, as opposed to using the double pigtail plastic stents, uh, which actually maintain the fistula strap open and drain the uh, uh, content directly into the lumen. Uh, different materials and configuration, uh, and of course, without going into many details, uh, all we need to know is that when it comes to the, diff the uh, choice between plastic and, and metallic stent, uh, for the purpose of bariatric surgery, really metallic stents are the only ones that have a role, because the plastic ones, for as much as they're much easier to extract and they have a uh, strong radial force, they cause more symptoms, uh, uh, and they have a much higher likelihood of migration. Um, also, the mesh of the stent uh, has a particular uh, characteristics, and again, without going into many details, uh, in general, uh, in order to have more flexibility, we want to have uh, uh, mesh in the stent that are needed as opposed to braided. And then finally, in the choice of stent, we have to decide whether we're going to use a fully covered stent or a partially covered stent. If the fully covered stent uh, has the uh, pr um, uh, premise of completely isolating the leak, also the fact that there's no ingrowth uh, equals more migration as opposed to a partially covered stent uh, that decreases what we call, can call an endo leak if we extrapolate from the uh, uh, endovascular uh, literature, uh, but also it's a much more difficult to extract over time. Um, this is how uh, uh, stents are placed, uh, an initial evaluation endoscopically with contrast under fluoroscopy. We identify the area of the leak, uh, and then we pass a guard wire distal to that, uh, because most of the time we have to dilate the sleeve and uh, relieve the distal obstruction. Um, you can see in the left lower, uh, let's see if this works, over here, uh, the actual waste of the stent that is compressed in uh, the, uh, the stricture, a nice 3D reconstruction of the CAT scan, and then finally, a few weeks later, a complete resolution of the leak. So what are the results of uh, stenting? Um, there's obviously uh, uh, many studies in the literature, and we, when we put everything together, Overall, the fully covered stent uh, tend to have a better success rate, but also a significantly higher migration rate uh, compared to the partially covered stent, which still present up to a 15% rate of migration. And the issue of migration we're, we're going to discuss now because it's certainly one of the uh, uh, most worrisome problems that we face with stent. Other complication of stent is of a geostrictures from uh, overgrowth of scar tissue on the proximal phalange of the stent, bleeding, perforation, and even stent-related mortalities. Newer bariatric stents are uh, being described and being used. Uh, some of these are not available in the US, but have been extensively studied elsewhere. Um, and they're fully covered. They tend to be larger and longer. Um, and they are more uh, pliable, so certainly more comfortable. However, the fact that they're larger give more symptoms, uh, and they lead to, most of the times, a higher percentage of early removal because of intolerability of, uh, uh, of the patient. And of course, as a result, esophageal strictures. Uh, these are three examples of the bariatric specific, so, so to speak, stents. The mega stent is a fully covered stent with a 28 millimeter diameter, and uh, the end of the stent is 36 millimeter in an effort to decrease the migration. Uh, the beta stent uh, has uh, several cuffs approximately, um, again, to decrease the chance of migration. The overall length is 23 centimeter with a diameter of 24 millimeter. And finally, the gastroseal stent, again, longer and wider, uh, but also with a coverage of the uh, final end of the stent uh, because it's meant to go into the duodenum, uh, so in order to decrease ulcers and erosions in the duodenum itself. Um, this is one recent experience uh, from, uh, um, from Cairo uh, about uh, the use of mega stent on uh, 62 patients, the majority of which were uh, sleep gastrectomies. A leak closure in 82% of the cases, but it came with a pretty high price. Uh, uh, pain and vomiting was almost present in 100% of the patients. Premature removal, 11%. Deep ulcers, 94%. Esophageal strictures, 13%. And 6% perforation, which of course is something that needs to be put into the mix.
What about internal drainage? The idea of internal drainage is to drain the abscess back into the lumen and allow uh, over time for closure of that abscess cavity. It's something that is performed using a guard wire that is placed into the collection itself. Sun debridement can be made similar to what uh, we do uh, uh, when we use endoscopic drainage of pancreatic pseudocysts. And then we put uh, double pigtail stents uh, in order to keep that track open and revaluate over time. This is something that has been described a while ago. However, the experience in bariatric surgery is relatively recent and there's very few studies. Uh, these are the ones that are more commonly uh, cited uh, and they have the highest number of patients. And overall, the resolution is very good. It goes anywhere between 97%, 79%, 94%. 94%. However, this is a long way home. It takes a long time for these uh, areas to heal, uh, several endoscopies, uh, and the disadvantage uh, is that oral feeding cannot be resumed right away because there's still an open tract with, uh, with the cavity. There's always the potential for external migration of those stents if the uh, abscess cavity is not mature. Uh, pneumoperitoneum, strictures that are as, as a result of course of excessive uh, granulation tissue and scarring, ulcers, stent intolerance is very, very low compared to the self-expandable stents. And when we compare the two procedures, self-expandable versus endoscopic internal drainage, again, one of the uh, downsides of uh, draining internally is that these patients cannot be fed right away. So uh, they have to be on TPN or nasojejunal feedings. Um, but they're usually better tolerated. Uh, but it's important to know that uh, we have to wait until the cavity is mature before we start opening uh, and do uh, communication to the, uh, to the actual lumen of the stomach. And along the same line, the idea of uh, doing a septotomy, so instead of putting a stent, uh, opening up that septum and uh, uh, drain the cavity directly into the stomach, something has been described by many authors. Uh, uh, Manuel Galvao, of course, is one of the uh, uh, in, um, advocate of these procedures in this study with nine patients, uh, uh, average EGD numbers 2.3, minor complications that were treated endoscopically with a complete leak resolution, 100% of the cases. And the new kid on the block, so to speak, is this idea. This is not a new concept. It's been utilized in the past. Uh, uh, stems from the uh, utilization of wound back dressing for abdominal uh, and external wounds. And this is customized and applied to the end of an NG tube after the uh, uh, leak has been sized. Um, the, uh, the sponge is sutured to the NG tube, a loop is placed at the end so we can drag by the endoscope directly at the side of leak, and then this is attached to an NG tube. Uh, requires frequent change, usually every four or five days, because you don't want too much granulation to grow into the, uh, into the sponge and makes it difficult to remove. It's important to irrigate the NG tube with uh, saline before removal in order to, again, try to eliminate that uh, uh, excessive granulation tissue and bleeding after removal or exchange. Um, most of the papers uh, on this uh, uh, have a purpuri of reasons uh, for utilizing uh, this technique. Uh, and when we sort out just the uh, bariatric operations uh, uh, with the utilization of this technique, we end up with uh, very few cases in this particular paper, only 18 cases with good results. But if we look at the average duration of the therapy, 55 days, 49 days, and spending 55 days with an NG tube on and off is certainly not something that we would consider ideal as an option. But it's something that out there that we should consider and have in the armamentarium. Um, what about over the scope clips? Uh, these are becoming more popular now. The main limitations of the bat is the fact that most of these leaks are lateral and this clip uh, really uh, work best if you can have a straight shot at, at the leak at the area. And the second problem is that if you try to uh, uh, clip closed, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, clip close one of these leaks, um, the tissue is just too friable and certainly not going to take right away. So some people have utilized this technique uh, after uh, stenting or after uh, additional techniques when there's less inflammatory tissue, the leak opening is smaller and you just need the last bit of tissue to uh, close definitively these leaks. We already went over this slide. 
So uh, last uh, uh, few words on strictures. Uh, we all know about the incidents, uh, the issues are at the incisor angularis. Uh, uh, obviously, proximal leaks can result as, uh, as a consequence. And the main problem is really, some, uh, for some cases, is the axial rotation. And that's what's really the Achilles heel of the uh, sleeve gastrectomy and also the treatment of, uh, uh, of these strictures. The diagnosis endoscopically, it's important because we can distinguish if this is a functional or a mechanical uh, uh, obstruction. A functional obstruction means that we are able to traverse that area, although we have to do some maneuvers with the endoscope. So this is an angulation problem or helix stenosis as opposed to a mechanical one. And the treatment is probably different. Uh, the management initially is conservative. Uh, we, we don't spend too much time on this. Uh, endoscopic dilatation is what people uh, mostly talk about, plus or minus a stent. And when we talk about endoscopic dilatation, we have to really look into the details because the techniques are very different and the results are very different. Uh, in this particular study, uh, they mixed uh, both pneumatic dilatation with regular uh, balloon uh, dilatations. In other words, using the Achalasia high-pressure balloons at this end, uh, comparing with the same, with the CRE that we would use for stenosis from a gastric bypass, with an overall success of 88%. But when it comes to strictures that are more do, uh, due to a uh, uh, helical uh, rotation along the long axis of the sleeve, the results are much worse. And the positive outcome, outcome in, in this uh, particular study of uh, expert endoscopies was only 60%. So what's the management algorithm here? Um, again, the main thing is trying to figure out if there's a twist or not. If there's a twist, uh, starting with an achalasia balloon and then uh, reevaluate a few weeks later, uh, potentially if there's a persistence of that uh, area, putting a stent, although uh, the chance of having to take the patient back to the upper room becomes much higher, as opposed to when there's just a strictures due to either a stenosis or edema or something that can be stented and ballooned and it probably has a much higher likelihood of uh, uh, lasting over time. So in conclusion, endoscopy has a key role in reoperative bariatrics. Uh, uh, when it comes to revisional bariatric operations, it really targets uh, small areas, either the size of the pouch or the size of the anastomosis. Um, there are various approaches to the uh, use of endoscopy for the complications, uh, and the timing of the endoscopy is essential. The earlier, the better. Once the leak is chronic, it's a lot more difficult to deal endoscopically, and most of these patients are, end up with complex revisions. Stents uh, have a high migration. It's important to do a close follow-up, uh, and as far as internal drainage, I think the data is still scarce, but uh, it's still always an option. Thank you very much. Thank you.